strong um, accelerator center that uh, um, caters to industry and to basic research from the most of the Department of Energy and Department of Defense. And uh, Valeria is originally from Russia. She got a bachelor's degree at St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg University and then came to the United States for a PhD from Purdue University in just in 2007, so she's a relatively recent graduate. She went to Idaho State University, uh, first as a lecturer, then a postdoc, and now she's a, an assistant professor there. The university works mostly on the contract system, so she's a research, uh, research assistant professor. And uh, her research is in the intermediate uh, nuclear energy, nuclear physics, which is NEVs for, for the rest of us. So it's very low energy for the high energy physics here. <laughs> and very, very high energy for the solid state physics here. And uh, I'm not going to uh, explain what she does because I think she can do it much better than me. And she's going to talk on the photonuclear production of uh, isotopes. There are publications, and I'm going to let you welcome Valeria here. I'm going to take care of the mic. Okay, thank you very much, um, Paolo, for such a warm introduction. Um, I'm indeed from the Idaho State University, from the Idaho Accelerator Center, and uh, my talk is going to, um, my talk consists of three parts. I'll talk briefly about photonuclear reactions in general because as far as I understand, um, as Paolo said, it's not really high energy, it's not really low energy, so for some of you, uh, maybe it will be um, a little bit new. And then I will talk about applications, about potential applications. In particular, we are making medical isotopes, medical radioisotopes. And finally, I will discuss the results of our work. So let me begin with the photonuclear reactions and photonuclear physics. As you can see from the name, as you can guess from the name, um, these are the reactions which are induced by photons, by gammas. And here is a rough representation of what is happening, uh, a crude representation of what is happening when the photon is incident on the target nuclei, nucleus. Um, the nucleus becomes compound, <coughs> it's excited, and then what happens, you have some prompt particles emitted immediately. Uh, typically it happens within 10 to negative 22 seconds. Um, and there are also delayed particles. So as you have our beta decay, then um, there are neutrons or protons or alpha particles emitted until you get your final radioactive nucleide, which you can detect by the characteristic uh, spectrum. And I'm going to talk about are more showing you particular examples. But this is basically the overall scheme of the photonuclear production. So if you think about the probability of this interaction happening uh, or a cross-section of this reaction, it of course depends on the energy of the incident photon. So the energy of the incident photon tells you uh, what's the probability of the particular reaction to happen. And typically, the photo absorption cross-section, um, as a function of the energy of the photon, uh, typically it's broken into four regions. The first region up to about 10 MeV is so-called nuclear resonant fluorescence. These energies are too small to, um, let me show it, highlight it in here. This energy is too small to actually um, knock out nucleons out of the nuclei. Uh, but it's large enough to excite individual nucleons inside the nucleus. So there are very narrow uh, resonance lines in here, um, even though they're relatively tall, but um, they're so, so narrow that uh, they cannot really, um, you can't really see much in there. And as I said, mostly single particle, single hole excitations are achieved. You don't really, you cannot really knock out a nucleus. And the typical order of magnitude is some nanobars or millibars, pretty small cross-section. As you move to the second region, uh, this is so-called giant dipole resonance region. And the reason it's called so because uh, at this energy between 10 and 30 MeV, the wavelength of the photon becomes comparable to the size of the nucleus and it causes resonances. And basically what happens is our 
um, your nucleons, primarily neutrons or protons, sometimes it can be a, an alpha particle, maybe two neutrons, something like that, they can be knocked out from the nucleus and this is the region we are dealing with. Um, the collective excitations which, ha which happen, they're, they're called collective because it's basically an oscillation of neutrons against the protons at dipole. Um, the cross-section is very high in this region, relatively high maybe, but it's hundreds of uh, millibarns. Sometimes it gets closer to a barn, which is pretty large. And the energy of the resonance, the peak energy, it's uh, inversely proportional to the cube root of the atomic number. Um, and as I said, the reason is because the energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Wavelength is comparable to radius, and radius is proportional to cube root of atomic number. So there is this... Uh, um, formula that allows you roughly estimate what is the energy of the peak of the resonance. The next region is so-called quasi-deuterine region. Um, starting at about 30 MeV, the energy of the photon are, becomes are large enough to start, in, um, to start interacting with the subnuclear particles and um, subnuclear structure. And, uh, for example, several nucleons together, and uh, one of the examples is neutron and proton, the most common example, and that's why it's called deuteron. It's not really a deuteron, but it's a quasi-deuteron regime. Uh, typically, the cross-section there from 1 to 2 millibarns, not very large, so we try not to go above 30 or 40 MeV. Uh, um, and again, this, this, re this boundary is, is arbitrary, so it depends on a particular cross-section, but typically it's between 30 and 40. Um, and the equation you see here just tells you, uh, this is a sum rule, uh, which tells you that the integral of this cross-section from 0 to the end of this region, to 140, um, is proportional to z, um, and it's inversely proportional to a, and this uh, empirical um, equation can be used to roughly estimate the total absorption, photonuclear absorption. Uh, typically, it's spread about 80, about 70 percent goes to this region, and about 30 percent goes to the, this region. But again, it depends um, it depends on the particular reaction. And finally, the very last region is our photomeson production. So now the energy becomes greater than 140 MeV, which is a lot for us, um, which is a rest mass of the pine or pi meson. And then you have an interaction uh, with individual nucleons and excite nuclear resonances. And there are several delta resonances for um, separately for neutrons and protons happening at about um, 300 MeV and higher energies. But again, as I said, we are really interested in this huge bump in here, in this huge peak, and this is the energy we are working with. So we want our photon to have an energy between 10 and 30 or 40 MeV. So as I said, there are different reactions that you can induce. You can knock out a neutron, you can knock, knock out a proton, you can knock out a combination of these particles. Um, the minimum energy necessary to knock them out, the so-called threshold energy, depends on the atomic number. And here you can see these black dots here, they represent the threshold energy for gamma P reaction, which means the photon goes in, the proton goes out. Um, these white dots here, gamma N reaction, photon in, neutron out. And as you can see, they are quite similar. However, when you are knocking out a proton from the nucleus, you have to overcome a Coulomb barrier. So you have an extra, you have to spend some extra energy to do that. And of course, this amount of energy increases as you increase the atomic number because the charge of the nucleus becomes bigger and bigger and bigger as you increase Z. So that's why we have one more line in here, which is so-called effective gamma P, or the real gamma P threshold. Basically, this plot tells you that if you want, for example, to knock out a proton from an element with the atomic number of 60, you have to have about 20 MeV. If you want to knock out a neutron, you need about twice less. So gamma N reactions are easier to accomplish. They don't require as much energy as gamma P. So here is another plot that shows approximately um, how, uh, what, what is the total photonuclear absorption consist of. So here you see the total. It's just the, basically the probability of absorbing a photon, no matter what you are knocking out. Now, the, one of the strongest terms are gamma N and gamma P. You can knock out a neutron. You can knock out a proton. 
both neutron and proton, two neutrons, and there are a lot of high order terms which we're not really considering here. And you can see here um, a plot that approximately shows you what is the fraction of each of these terms in here. Uh, this plot was done for a nickel 58, and you can see the total, uh, the, the, the uh, solid line, the total photonuclear absorption cross section. And then you can see different reactions, and you can see they have much smaller cross section and different threshold energies depending on the particular reaction. But the important point here, again, is that the highest contribution comes from uh, gamma N and gamma P. <coughs> okay, so how can we create photons of such energy of 10, 20, 30, 40 MeV? There are a lot of different photon sources, um, but the one I'm going to talk about today is a linear electron accelerator. Um, as Paolo said, I'm working at the IEC, Idaho Accelerator Center. We have a lot of accelerators, uh, and most of them are electron accelerators. Uh, we have some proton accelerators, but um, most of our experiments uh, we are doing using three Linux, electron Linux, lin linear accelerators. And here is a rough, very crude representation of what's happening. So you have an electron beam line, um, basically a pipe, steel, made, uh, stainless steel pipe with the vacuum inside, and you have electrons, um, which originally come from the electron gun, and then you have a bunch of cavities, and you have magnets, and you have RF um, frequency to, to bunch these particles, to make some pulses of electrons, and accelerate them. And finally, what you have at the exit is high-energy electrons that go out of here. What you put in front of them is a so-called uh, converter or radiator. There are different names for that. But basically, you just want uh, a material made from our, a high-Z material. Uh, typically, it's tungsten or tantalum, something which has high atomic number and can withstand a lot of heat, so very high melting temperature. Uh, because all these electrons, as soon as they heat a high-Z material, they go into slow down, they go into break, and as a result of this deceleration, they're going to produce a lot of photons. And at the same time, they're going, a lot of heat is going to be deposited in there, that's why you want to have high melting temperatures. So the photons you have here can be used uh, to produce photonuclear reactions. So you just put your sample right in here, and the sample um, experiences high photon flux. Uh, here is an example of the Bramstrom or breaking radiation spectrum that you see in here, and that's the um, uh, number of photons as a function of their energy. If the electron beam is, here it looks like it's 35 MeV, um, the maximum energy of your photons will be 35 MeV, and there is a distribution which looks approximately like 1 over, uh, one over E. Um, in the largest part, of it, not, not the buried tail. So photon flux is a function of energy. Your photons that you produce here will have different energies, um, high energy, lower energy. On the other hand, your flux is going to be a function of position. The number of photons are going to be different, um, is going to be different depending on where you are. So here you see the results of the Monte Carlo simulations for the photon fluency or uh, um, fluence or flux. Number of photons are per second per centimeter squared. And um, obviously most of them you can see here on the axis and you can see how flux decreases. So at any given point in space, you will have photons of different energy. So photon flux is not only a function of energy, it's also a function of the coordinate. It's a function of um, X, Y, and Z. So once you have our high photon flux, as we said, a reaction is possible. How can we estimate what will be the yield, what will be the final um, amount of activity that you're going to produce, or the final amount of the new isotopes created? Uh, to do that, what you need to do is just multiply the cross-section by the photon flux and integrate their product. Um, you multiply the whole thing by the number of target nucleides, and you also have a time. Um, mm, uh, it's also a function of time, how long you radiate your sample. The longer you radiate, the more isotopes you're going to produce until you reach a plateau at some point. So as an example here, you can see our, the results of the simulations for one of the reactions. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more details later. But basically what we are doing here, we're starting with zinc 68. This is our target. 
uh, we are shooting photons on it and we are knocking out a proton. As you are knocking out a proton, your zinc 68 turns into copper 67. And in your sample, which is originally made from zinc, you're going to have some copper atoms. How to calculate how many copper atoms you're going to produce for a certain beam energy, for a certain flux, or a certain shape of your target? So you take a look at your photon flux, which is this dashed line. You take a look at the spectrum of the cross-section, which is shown by this solid line. You multiply them by each other, which is shown right in here and then you integrate the product. And the area under the curve of the product multiplied by, by constant and multiplied by the time correction is going to tell you how many atoms of copper 67 you're going to make for, um, for, a particular, for that particular, for these particular conditions, for this flux and for this cross section. So this is just some brief overview of what we are doing. Um, I would like to switch gears a little bit right now and talk about um, nuclear medicine, actually, um, about why do we need to produce medical isotopes and uh, what are they going to be needed for. So the grandfather of father or grandfather of nuclear medicine is uh, George de Havisi, um, who is known uh, for a Nobel Prize he received in 19. 43, and he was a student of Rutherford, and Rutherford gave him a task um, in 1911, which is over 100 years ago. Basically, he told him to separate so-called radium D from lead, and radium D was a name for the isotope of lead, lead uh, 211, and basically he had to separate lead from lead chemically, and of course he failed because it's not possible to separate um, uh, all the isotopes of the same chemical elements, they have the same chemical properties. So he was very depressed about it, um, to say the least, but he kept working and he's known for um, the first radio tracer experiment. Um, at that time, uh, Hevesy was staying in the boarding house and he was suspicious that the lady um, in the boarding house was reusing the food that he didn't eat the day before. So one day he didn't finish his meat, uh, his meal, I'm sorry, and he put some radium D, some radioactive isotopes, in the leftovers and said, thank you, I'm done. And next day when his uh, uh, landlady prepared meatloaf, he brought an electroscope and they could see the signal. <laughs> so um, she was really ashamed um, and she gave up. Um, immediately admitted because uh, the power of science was so strong she couldn't say anything. And this is, this is known as the first radio tracer investigation. Um, it's all written down, I didn't make it up. Now, the first real radio tracer experiment where radioisotopes were used uh, was done to study the blood flow in the human body. And it was done by Hermann Blom Blomgert in 1925. And here you can see the setup was very simple. Um, you can obviously see a person. There was a screen, a lead shielding, so the rays do not penetrate through it. And there was a detector in there. And a person was injected an isotope, and then it travels through the body, and it goes here, here, here. And there are no counts in the detector until the radio tracer goes into this arm. And you can basically measure how long did it take for the blood to travel through the whole body. It was a very simple, maybe for us now it sounds very simple experiment, but it was uh, the first study of how fast the blood is flowing, how good the heart is working. Um, and since then, of course, there are a lot of complicated experiments done um, using radio tracers, user, using radioisotopes as tracers. Um, radioisotopes are not the only tracers available. There are a lot of other isotopes used for that purposes, but they are close to perfect, close to ideal, because they are non-toxic usually, or very low toxic, and present in the body before the experiment, before the study, and they don't have effect on the study. Most of them disappear rapidly, it depends on the half-life, but typically it's uh, several days, sometimes hours, depending on the isotopes. And you can detect them in very small amounts using um, different spectrometers or gamma cameras or um, other techniques. So how do we use medical isotopes? What's, what's the demand? 
And here you can see some numbers that you maybe didn't um, think how many people, how many hospitals are using radioisotopes. Um, about 50,000 procedures are done daily only in the U.S. In the whole world, it's much more than that. However, the supply for radioisotopes is pretty low for many of them. Uh, the problem with the radioisotopes is that they decay. You cannot really st stock them and have supply for 100 years. This is something you have to have on a regular basis, supply every day or every week or whatever, depending on the half-life. And uh, very often, production of these radioisotopes, which are mostly done in reactors, uh, depends on many uh, conditions, depends on many uh, circumstances that you cannot control. So in general, if you're thinking about radioisotopes used in medicine, there are two main applications. The first one is diagnostics. Um, radioisotopes are used to figure out um, um, typically um, cancers, how big they are, how aggressive they are. Um, it's also used a lot for investigating uh, cardiac activity, how is the heart working, uh, finding some inflammations or some growth in bones. A lot of different applications depending on the isotope. Um, it's also used for therapy and it's used a lot as our radiopharmaceuticals, alpha and beta emitters, which have very um, small um, region, but they can attack cancer pretty strongly, uh, or some sealed sores. Uh, Cobalt-60 is one of the most well-known when the patient just comes to the hospital, undergoes the procedure and goes home. Brachytherapy is the uh, a name for a therapy when the radiation source is actually injected into a patient. You can see an example in here. You can see all these seeds here. Um, these are some tiny, uh, basically, pellets. Um, usually it's used for some localized cancer, pretty small one, because again, the range is pretty tiny. They, they, they kill everything around couple millimeters around them, but they don't affect the body. And the person can have them inserted and just walk around for, with them for a long time. So there are a lot of different techniques and a lot of applications, and this market is really huge and growing. <coughs> Most of it, though, it's di is diagnostic, not that much therapy. Um, when you talk about uh, medical imaging in general, there are two types of medical imaging. The first one probably you're more familiar with is uh, anatomic, when you just want to see the shape. You have a bone broken, you go get an x-ray and they show you here is your fracture. It just shows you the shape of the organ, but it doesn't give you any information about the function. Um, another example is ultrasound, MRI, CT scans, all this. Um, however, there is other kind of uh, imaging, and this is where you need your radioisotopes, uh, single photon um, emission computer tomography and positron emission tomography. These are techniques that show functions. They don't just show you, here is the shape of the heart. They show you how much is absorbed and if the heart still looks the same shape, but it absorbs more sugar than before, as an example, or more some other um, biological molecules than before, then you can make conclusions about different diseases. For that, you need isotopes. Uh, SPECT is a technique, as uh, again I said, it's a photon emission uh, tomography. Basically, you put a patient into the camera, into the gamma camera, you inject um, an isotope, gamma emitting isotope, and then gammas are detected by the camera and the image is reconstructed. Where does it come from? Uh, PET is a similar thing, it's just positron emission tomography. Basically, you inject a positron emitting isotope and as a positron is emitted inside your body, it emits electron pretty much immediately and they annihilate and then they shoot two photons back to back, 511 kV. Again, it's detected by the same camera and again, it can tell you where the problem is. Um, typically, PET has high resolution, but it's more expensive and uh, um, and there are some other drawbacks. I don't want to get into details here. The summary is that you need radioisotopes for metabolic imaging. Here is an example of the metabolic imaging of heart. And <coughs> uh, basically, it just says how much is, it's a stress test, how much, are, how much is absorbed for in, into different conditions. 
I'm not a doctor, but presumably it helps them to see the difference and make conclusions about different diseases. Just some numbers here to compare how many scans were done, cardio scans only, were done 8 million in 2007 and over 13 million in 2010. So you can see the number almost doubled, um, taking into account that the population of our planet increases and people in general live longer, they, um, they seek more, they have heart conditions more often. This number is going to go up and up and up. It's not going to go down, um, which means we need more and more and more isotopes. So how they're made currently? As I mentioned before, there are basically two modes of production. Most isotopes are made in reactors currently. Um, one of the most common, the working horse of isotopes is technetium-99 metastable state. Over 80% of all diagnostic procedures are made with this isotope. Cobalt-60, iridium-192, iodine-131, so you can see all these isotopes. And typically in reactor, you make a neutron-rich isotopes. Um, some isotopes, though, are easier and cheaper to make in accelerators. And when I say accelerators, I mean cyclotrons, the accelerators where you typically use protons and, you, and they move in circular orbits. Um, and these are some examples. Fluorine 18, which is, again, one of the most common isotopes for positron um, emission, and some other isotopes, tellurium iodine, and so on. Linear accelerators can also be used to produce isotopes. Um, there are a lot of pros for them. They're, they're pretty cheap. It's much cheaper to build an accelerator than to build a reactor. They're safe. You don't have our uranium fuel for that, for example, plutonium. You start with a target material, which is maybe zinc or molybdenum or whatever. Um, they are, you don't have any issues with criticality, you, you, you're not concerned. You turn the switch off, your reaction is shut down. You cannot do that with the reactor. Um, and the amount of waste, radioactive waste they produce is also very small compared to reactors. However, the amount of the isotopes they produce is pretty low. So, and, and um, if you compare linear accelerators with uh, cyclotrons, then again, cyclotrons are very easy to operate. You put it, there are very small ones, literally you can put it on the table in the hospital and you can make isotopes in there, push the button, get an isotope in here. It's not gonna work with a linear accelerator. You have to have a person who knows how to operate it. Um, you have to have um, personnel which is um, knowledgeable in physics and nuclear engineering. However, all of these tools can be used to make isotopes. Here is the chart of nuclear of nucleides. Um, maybe you have seen it before. Our x-axis is number of neutrons, y-axis is number of protons, and this dash line is basically uh, the line with the slope equals one. And these are all the isotopes we are currently having. As you can see, most of them, they have more protons. They're on this side. They have more protons than they have neutrons. So here is another diagram representing pretty much the same plot. So along this axis, you have light elements and heavy elements. These are more neutrons, these are more protons. So this region in here, uh, neutron-rich neutron isotopes that are mostly made in reactors is pretty poorly understood. Um, the proton side is more explored and more well known. Okay, um, let me talk now about our results and I'm going to discuss two cases. Uh, we make uh, a lot of different isotopes and um, I'm just going to talk about two particular examples. One of them is gamma N. You have a neutron knockout from molybdenum 100 to make molybdenum 99. And molybdenum 99 in turn decays into technetium 99M through beta decay. And as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, technetium 99M is very, very important isotope. Um, and there is an overall demand for that. Actually, several years ago, um, there was a shutdown of several reactors simultaneously. And it was a big hit for all the hospitals over the world um, because technetium 99 made in using only maybe uh, five or eight reactors. Um, none of them in the United States, by the way. There is one in Canada and several in Europe, South America, um, Australia, Africa. Um, two reactors that were producing over 50% of technetium had to shut down due to some issues, and people were left without isotopes. A lot of procedures were 
postponed or canceled or our people were giving patients were giving alternative imaging. Um, anyway, it, it was a very big problem and since then people are trying to find alternative routes to produce technetium 99 m and using accelerators was one of the proposed solutions. And another reaction is producing copper 67 uh, through the gamma P knocking out the proton and there will be some differences between these two reactions I'll talk about. So in general the first thing you need to radiate your sample. So here is our accelerator, electrons are hitting the converter, producing photons and then these photons are going to be incident on your target and will knock out a neutron as you can see here. So you start from molybdenum 100, you end up with molybdenum 99. Very easy. Here is our accelerator um, that we used, it's a scheme of that. It actually consists of two uh, parts. The first one accelerates electrons up to 25 MeV. Um, the second one adds 23 MeV more, so the total maximum energy we can get is 48. Typically we run it at 35 to 40 MeV. Um, there are some um, optical elements, magnets, basically to focus your beam, to steer it. Um, and uh, there are also some <coughs> flags to see how big is your beam, how diverged is it, where is it, should you move it up or down, left or right. So, but the main parts are, as I said, just these two accelerators and steering magnets. And finally, you put your target right in here. <coughs> so once you have your, oops, something disappeared. So you have your electron beam at the end of the beam line and here is your target and the photons are going to go all around it. Here you have an actual picture. This is the beam line. You can see these flanges. So the electrons are traveling inside this vacuum pipe. Now these two things here are actually um, cooling for our converter. The converter is going to experience a lot of electrons going through it and breaking. Electrons lose energy and heat up the converter a lot. So there is a converter in between, it's sandwiched between these two aluminum blocks and the blocks are empty inside and there is a water running through them. Um, you can see these blue, this water, water pipes and basically it's just for cooling uh, the converter. And finally you can see the sample holder in here, this white thing is alumina crucible inside which we have our sample and um, which is irradiated for hours. So in general, um, photoneutron production is, gives you pretty high yield because the cross-section for gamma N in general is a little bit higher than gamma P. Here is just some examples of different isotopes that you can produce using gamma N or gamma 2 N reactions. And you can see that they might be used for treating different diseases and for imaging as well. Using photoproton reaction, knocking out a proton, some examples um, you can see here as well, here is our copper 67, you can make indium, lutetium, and again it can be used for different purposes. So once you created some new isotopes, you want to know how much have you created. And to do that you need to measure the yield, to measure the actual amount of new atoms, transmuted atoms. So we are using high purity germanium detector, you can see here. Uh, which is capped at the uh, liquid nitrogen temperature and you can see that's the typical spectrum that you get from the detector. So you see a lot of lines in here and each line represents a particular reaction. So actually looking at the spectrum you can figure out where is my particular reaction at this energy, how big is this peak and depending on the size of the peak you can figure out the activity. So here is one of the example. This is just number of counts as a function of energy and you can see how this number of counts increases. You just feed it and calculate the area under this curve. The total number of counts, you divide it by the efficiency of your detector, geometrical efficiency, energy efficiency, and you also divide it by the branching ratio because each particular transition, let's say in this case it's 899 kV. Um, if you have a particular isotope, it can decay using different paths or different routes and each, route, uh, each path has its own probability. So this branching ratio is just a probability of a particular energy line happening. Um, so your final activity can be calculated or measured using the spectrum. And it can be compared with the predictions, um, the equation I showed be before. When you have flux, when you have cross-section, you can calculate activity and compare these two numbers. 
So for the case of molybdenum um, 99, um, basically we just looked at the photon flux through the sample. We multiplied this flux by the corresponding cross-section, each pixel in here, and did the integration and got the overall activity of the whole sample and compared these results with the experiments. And they were very close, within 20% from each other, simulated and measured activity. So we're making about seven megabecquerel per gram of initial sample, or per one kilowatt of electron beam, and per one hour of radiation. And you can scale it up if you're using more powerful beam, if you're using bigger target, and if you're radiating for longer. So all these scaling up um, issues, they have their own problems. For example, if you increase the mass, you increase the size of your target, and the average flux, flux decreases, because as, as your target gets bigger, um, the, the photon flux does not, it's high only in the center, but it drops at the edges. Um, as uh, time of radiation, you can't increase infinitely as well, because basically it's one minus e to the negative lambda t, which is a plateau. At some point, it doesn't matter for how much longer you radiate, you're not gonna get more activity. And increasing the power of the electron beam sounds easy. However, as you increase the power, the temperature increases a lot, and you have to solve heating issues, which is not easy. Uh, one more issue you're facing Let's say you have your original molybdenum 100 target. You're shooting photons, and some of these atoms turn into molybdenum 99. Now, how are you going to separate them? You cannot separate them chemically because both of them are molybdenum. You have to be very um, creative about how you do it. And there are several ways to do it, but one of them I'm going to show here, uh, which basically is consists of mixing two types of particles, small particles, nanoparticles. One of them are your target particles shown in gray. This is your molybdenum 100. And the other kind of particles is your catcher material. So when photon is incident, it's going to knock out um, a neutron, and the molybdenum 99 atom is recoiled as well. And then this atom can be caught can be trapped inside your catcher particle. And then you can just separate your catcher particles from your target particles and recover molybdenum 99. Um, another idea proposed was just instead of using two types of nanoparticles, mixing them and then separating them, you can use your molybdenum 100 nanoparticle and then just coat it with some kind of polymer coating. And then the molybdenum 99 recoils into the coating and if you can dissolve the coating, the molybdenum-99 will be um, carried away with this dissolved coating. Here is the plot that shows what is the energy of molybdenum-99 versus 100. So for 100, you can see this peak here. Energy is very low. They cannot penetrate this coating. However, molybdenum-99, energy distribution is pretty uniform, up to 10 keV. They can go through the coating, get stuck somewhere in the coating, and then you can catch them this way. Um, one more example is copper 67. So now you're knocking out a proton. In general, the flux is a little bit lower. Um, I'm sorry, the cross-section is a little bit lower, so your final yield is lower, one megabecquerel per gram per kilowatt per hour. However, the beauty of gamma P reactions is that chemically your final product and your target are different. So now you can just chemically separate them. Uh, we, however, use a two-step separation. The first one is just sublimation. We use the fact that zinc and copper have very different melting temperatures. So we basically evaporate zinc and leave the copper behind. Uh, we evaporate most of the zinc and leave the copper behind. And then for final um, separation, uh, we just use a chromatography column and we send it through the column so that zinc sticks to the resin and copper goes through and finally you have your radioactive copper in this vial as an elevate. And the very last step is labeling of biological molecules. So for imaging, typically you don't just inject a solution of copper 67. Uh, because what you want to do is you want your radioisotope to go to a particular organ, a liver or kidney or whatever. So what you do is you label a, a molecule, a biological molecule, you label with the radioactive copper. Ideally, you just want your radioactive copper to take all the spaces. However, let's say that your radioactive copper, in addition to your radioactive copper, you also have some stable copper or cold copper, 63 or 65. 
then it can take some spaces and the overall activity of this molecule becomes slower and the quality of the image becomes lower. So you have to be very careful about copper impurities. Uh, to do that, we are performing inductive coupled plasma mass spectroscopy to make sure that everything we are working in, acids, resins, um, sublimation apparatus, everything is copper clean. We don't have high concentration. Actually, we cannot have more than one ppm. And even just if you touch your sample with your hands, human body has so much copper, I mean, for this process, that you're going to contaminate the sample. So your lab has to be very clean. Uh, just the last um, comment, ideally you would like to scale it up. You want to produce more to compete successfully with reactors. However, as I mentioned before, scaling up brings up some issues. One of them is heating. You have to cool your sample a lot. Typically you cool it with water, but if you have water flowing through a high radiation field, you have a lot of free radicals, you have a lot of um, ions that you don't really want to do. You have a lot of corrosion that you typically don't see. So water starts reacting with virtually everything, making oxides, making a lot of things that are destroying your experiment. So scaling up or, um, requires a lot of um, thinking. So here is just a summary that um, nuclear production can be used to make isotopes and I believe that we can successfully compete with the reactors, especially reactors getting so older um, with the overall negative perception of the public to new nuclear reactors. I don't think anybody would be happy if uh, you know that tomorrow they're going to build a new reactor right next to your house. Uh, people in general are against it. Um, reactors require more and more time for a shutdown and repair and I believe that the future is for accelerators. There are some advantages, there are some disadvantages, but I believe that we can um, figure it out. And I would like to thank the members of our group, and I would like to thank you for your attention as well. <laughs>